What does John do? John, what do you do? I work for uh, Highway Baptist Church here in well in Westville. And yourself, John, uh, Mark? I'm with the Foreign Mission Board, Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, I'm, my assignment is here with the Natal Baptist Association as a uh, campus chaplain. Campus right, right, minister, right. Yes, uh, yes. Student minister. Yes, yes, Mark. Yes, sir. Yes. That's a nice pleasure. So we are all in the same field. <laughs> I think so. But uh, we might have different goals, you know. Uh, or the means of attaining them. I guess so. Different means of attaining them. Yes, it's a privilege for me to be honored with two giants you know, oh. of the Christian <laughs> world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether exactly. we, yes. you may be the only person that would say that of us. <laughs> so we're giants. Yes. It's certainly friend. a privilege for us to be uh, with an uh, unquestionable giant of the Islamic world. <laughs> No, my office is open to all, at all times. Uh, uh, actually, people don't make appointments, and I don't. I also don't make appointments, because then you tie yourself down. Uh, to me, anybody comes along there and says, right, what am I doing? Say, no, I'm having to let them come in. Welcome, welcome. Uh, yes. That's good. No, I'm entirely at your disposal. Good. Entirely at your disposal. Well, you, you said to me on the phone the other day that you... Uh, you did see the, the tapes of when uh, my other friends were here. No, I didn't. See. I think my son must have told you. That. Oh, was that your son? My son, yes. The young man. Okay. He's my son, yes. I see. He must have said, "Did that, Yusuf, did that." So you didn't get the first word, Yusuf. 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 Yeah. Did that. So you got the word, did that. Yeah. Like yours, Mark. I'll catch the word, the name Mark, John, yeah. and the rest. Of, yeah. Now you know, I have to think now. Turner, yes, Turner. Yeah, okay. But now again, this. It'll be difficult because I didn't hear a name like that before. Right. So this okay. is how the mind works, yes. Uh, yes, uh, Mark, I, what can I do for you? Well, my interest and in, uh, the interest, uh, uh, maybe I need to give you some background on please, wh please, why please. I would be here. Either, yes, yes. Mr. D. Dot, but yes. uh, two or three weeks ago now, while you were in uh, on your trip overseas, overseas yes. uh, we had a news correspondent who was here from... Um, uh, he lives in Nairobi, Kenya, but he works for the same foreign mission board that I work for. Right, right. We also had a photographer, and then right. one of their superiors were here. Right. They were interested in writing a story yes. on the Islamic Propagation Center yes. and finding out if we could some of your methods of training and teaching and some of your goals and that kind of thing, not in any kind of way to expose for any kind of counterattack or any of that, but just because we're interested in the nuts and bolts of your very aggressive and uh, certainly very effective approach. I, I would say no, not aggressive. You say militant would be <laughs> more appropriate. Militant, yes. Okay, militant. Uh, uh. So like Jesus Christ, I said, you know, he was a very aggressive person, according to the scriptures, calling people generation of wipers, he whited sepulchres, the wicked and adulterous generation. I said, terrible for a man of God talking like that. Uh, so he says, no. But now I would say, well, uh, according to your records, he sounds very, very aggressive, yeah. and he's actually going out looking for trouble. Because when you call the leaders of your nation, the religious hierarchy, wicked and adulterous generation, you mean common parlance, you know, so how you translate that? Mm -hmm. This is a wicked and adulterous generation. So it's terrible, terrible. You know, the man is actually uh, looking for a showdown. Mm -hmm. So if he gets what's coming to him, I say he deserves it. So. However, it's a militant. Militant, I think. Islam is militant. Mm. There's no apologies for that. You see, the Quran tells us to tell you and the Jews. Qul in Arabic means say, we are told to say, tell them. Ya Ahl al Kitab, so O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, La taghlufi dinikum. It says, do not go to extremes in your religion. In your religion, whatever you believe, don't go to extremes. And don't say anything about God except the truth. Innam al Masih, most certainly the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah, is a messenger of God. And a word proceeding from him. Al-Qaha ila Maryam wa ruhum minhum Which he bestowed upon Mary And a spirit proceeding from him Fa'aminu billahi wa rusulihi So believe in Allah, God Almighty And his messenger, Jesus This is the true position That he is a mighty messenger of God He is the Messiah Believe in God 
and his messenger, Jesus. So we are told to tell you both, Jews and Christians, don't go to extremes about Jesus. The Jews in the Talmud, they say, that because he had no earthly father, actually they insinuate that a certain Roman soldier by the name of Pandera, he raped Mary. Have you come across that before? No, I'm not familiar with that. Not familiar? You read Josh McDowell? Uh, no, Josh. Right. Now he has written a book, Further Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh -huh. He had the evidence that demands a verdict, and then he wrote another one, Further Evidence. Further evidence. Yeah. And in that he quotes Jewish Talmud, where they are calling Jesus a bastard more than once. Is it? Yeah. That the bastard, son of Pandera, the bastard. This is quoted by your campus crusade, yeah. the leader of the campus crusade. No. Mary Bright. No, no, no. Or by Josh McDowell. Uh, no, yeah. Josh McDowell is quoting, quoting from the Jewish Talmud okay. that this is what the Jews say, that he is the bastard child of Mary, raped by a Roman soldier and gave off as the son of God. The Christians, they say, that because he has got no earthly father, his father is God. So we are told, he says, no, they are both going to extremes. The Jew is going to extreme, telling the Jew, don't go to extremes in your religion. You Christians, don't go to extremes in your religion. The true position is that he is a mighty messenger of God. He was born miraculously. We are made to accept that, I think you know. The Quran tells us that he was born miraculously, which many modern-day Christians, including the bishops of the Anglican Church, they don't believe today yeah. in the miraculous birth of Jesus. We believe. And that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. He healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. So look, this is the true position. He is the word of God. He is the spirit from God, but he is not God. Don't go to extremes. You don't go to extremes. You Jews, you don't go to extremes. This is the true position. This is our standpoint. So we are told, and this language of the Quran is militant. See, this is not soft soaping, so you know, uh, please, you Christians, don't interfere with us. You know, we pray five times a day, and we don't drink, and we don't gamble, and we fast for a whole month. You know, leave us alone in peace. No, no, no. We are told to tell you, you Jews and Christians, don't go to extremes in your religion, and don't say anything about God except what is befitting, the truth. So, Islam is a militant religion. The Quran is a militant book. But when you say aggressive, I think that term is not called for. That's all. Okay. Militant, okay. Militant, yes. Islam is militant. It tells you, it tells me to tell you, wala takulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. Now, this is the language of the Quran. Telling me to tell you, don't say Trinity. Wala takulu thalasa. In lakum. This is, stop it. It will be better for you. Inna mallahu ilahum wahid. For your God is one God. He is not three in one. So we are told what to tell you. This is not out of trying to be different from you or trying to score points on you. This is an article of faith with us that we are supposed to tell you, rectify you. Don't talk about Trinity. Don't say that Jesus is God. You're going to go to hell. The Quran says so. You'll go to hell. You see? So it is my duty if I, my people didn't do it. If they didn't do it, we are at fault. We haven't done the job. But when I see what I see and I understand, very, very you know, so, so succinctly put, we have to share. But in the process, you are feeling that the guy is attacking me. You know? I'm attacking your religion, the foundation of your faith. Because if there's no Trinity, there's no Christianity. Because Jesus has to be God to die on the cross. One man dying, he can't die for the sins of the world. John the Baptist, he was beheaded for whose sins? Zachariah, he was killed for whose sins? The Jews killed many prophets for whose sins? Nobody sins. So, Jesus Christ, if he died as a man, it's worthless. Many men have died, but they don't carry sins of, the, of mankind. Mm -hmm. So you have to believe that Jesus is God. And as God incarnate, he died for your sins. So he can wash away, redeem you from your sins. Right. So the Quran says, no, he is not God. He is not the begotten Son of God. He was not crucified. Now everything is say, militantly put. Don't say that. Don't talk like that. And then in others we are told, come. 
call the Christians and the Jews قول بس بيا تقول say يا أهل الكتاب تعالى انقض إلى كلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم that we come to common terms as between us and you let us get onto a common platform the Muslim is made to ask the Jews and the Christians come let us come onto a common platform and the terms and conditions of getting together the Quran says Allah na'buda illa Allah that we worship none but Allah wala nushrika bihi shay'an and that we associate no partners with him wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min duni Allah and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than God like a bishop or a pope you know whatever he says he says ditto ditto he says no 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 you and I we are all personally responsible to God for what we think and how we believe we are responsible isn't we are not to be led by the news by our priests our predicants our bishops or popes or mollies or molanas go to God and to go to God he says go to the, his book the book of God let us see let us come let us reason together see there's only one God the father in heaven he is a real God and his name in the Semitic languages is Allah the name of God Almighty in the language of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad is Allah. The Quran tells us call him by any name. As long as that name is not contaminated. Meaning, suppose you ask me what's the name of God? And if I told you his name is Muhammad, immediately you have a mental picture of a camel driver born some 600 years after Jesus, born in Makkah. His father's, if you read his biography, his father's name was Abdullah, his mother's name was Amina, and so on. He said, man, I know. Is that your God? You have a mental picture. As soon as you have a mental picture, in Islam it's forbidden. That name is not befitting, God Almighty. He said, his name is Rama. If you read the story of Rama, in the Ramayana, he said, oh, yes, I know, no. He had a wife called Sita, and she was abducted by the king of Ceylon and taken over for 12 years. Mm, I have a picture, mental picture. You say his name is Christ. So, ah, yes, immediately. The child born in the stable to a Jewish girl, circumcised on the eighth day. Right, I have a mental picture. Then, at the age of 12, he confounded the learned men in the temple. And then, at the age of 30, he's baptized by John the Baptist. And at the age of 33, according to your records, killed and done away with. I said, I have a mental picture. Immediately, that picture for God is rejected. Isn't it? You don't use any terms or expressions which create a mental picture. But call him by any name, God Almighty, because his are the most beautiful names, meaning his attributes. Call him the loving Father in heaven. Call him his merciful, his kind, his holy. Call him what you like. But don't use terms and expressions which contaminate the picture. Yes, yes, but does Ma. loving father, uh, loving father is okay. You can use loving father, father yes, yes. You see, I was telling. Because not associate, and I, I this I'm, I'm not militant. I don't want to be okay. Yes, I. Got that. But uh, would would not that question? Would not that? Well, loving father, I guess, is okay. But just father, because what if a person has a, a bad father? They've been abused. Right, right, right. In other words, so, they can have an image so, of God that is. Get it, get it. No, he says, I, I think I have uh, solved that problem. Okay. Islam has solved it for us. You see, in the Quran, we are given 99 attributes of God. Mm -hmm. I think you must have heard that before. I think so. That, that we in Islam, we know him by his attributes. There's no other way we can know him. Because he's not like a man or a monkey. He's not like an, ev like an elephant or a snake. That you can know God is like this or like that he is nothing like that but we know him by his attributes we say God is holy that's his attribute holiness is his attribute mm -hmm. we say he is merciful that's his attribute he is compassionate he is all knowing he is omniscient these are his attributes so in those attributes that the Muslim is given he is given 99 99 attributes coming through the lips of a person who didn't know how to read or write. A man who couldn't sign his own name. And yet he's giving you 99 attributes with a crowning name Allah as a proper name for God Almighty in the Semitic languages. Allah, but with 99 attributes. 
But in those 99 attributes, father is not one of them. That's amazing. Because any clever man you come across, BD, or professors of psychology, philosophy, whatever, and who is a believer in a creator, and if you ask him, he says, look man, tell me, I want you to give me some attributes to God, according to your learning, education, understanding. So he will start. He starts with, let's say, that he's kind, he says, yes, he's merciful, he says, yes, he's holy, he says, yes, he's compassionate, he says, yes, he's loving, Father in heaven, he says, yes. Within the first half a dozen, the man must come across the word Father. The Father in heaven, loving Father, whatever, in heaven. And that attribute is not in the Quran. But first I'm asking, I says, now look, the cleverest of us. He can't go beyond a dozen. Try and think, conjure up. You can't go beyond a dozen. And within the first half a dozen, Father is one of them. Father will be one of them. You know, the Father in heaven. This man Muhammad, he's surrounded by Jews and Christians in Medina. And you keep on hearing what the Jews say and the Christians say, the loving Father in heaven, the Father in heaven. But now, that word Father is not one of those attributes. So the question arises, why? Why should the Father be not included? Because in Arabic and Hebrew, Ab stands for Father. A-B-B. -B. Ab is Father in Hebrew. Ab, Father in Arabic. Because these are identical languages. You know, actually dialects of the same language. Ar Arabic and Hebrew. This word Ab is so easy, on everybody's tongue. But instead, the Quran says, Rabb. It's Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim the first verse of the Quran. It's Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord, Rabb, Rabb, Lord, Cherisher, Sustainer, Evolver of mankind. It would have been easier to say, Abb. And again and again in the Quran, Rabb, Rabb. Rabb, Lord, Cherisher, Sustainer, Evolver. So why would he go out of his way to produce a harder word, hush, and a, a harder word than Ab to say Rabb, Rabb, Rabb? So I'm telling people, I said, you see, words in their origin they might have beautiful connotations. Like, um, I mean, people who are com like companions, the companions of the Prophet or the disciples of Jesus. We would use the word in Arabic, companions, because companion you sit and eat together, companions, uh, breaking bread together, the French word, meaning, you know, we are like brothers. Comrade. It's a beautiful word for our relationship. But today that word is so contaminated. At one time in America, if somebody called you a comrade, I think you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. this, this guy is a commie. And they'll start following, the FBI or whoever, they will start following you up to see where does this guy go. This simple English word, gay, gay, I learned it at school, you know, in a poetry form. That's how they taught us, you know, so many things. Uh, I read a poetry uh, says, saying, Gentle lords and ladies, gay, on the mountain dawns the day. I forget the rest of it. I'm looking for that, you know, because I just remember these two lines. But it's quite a, uh, a long poem. Not very long, but it's a long poem. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you remember that. Gentle lords and ladies, gay, know, on the mountain dawns the day. Now I used to sing that, you know, at school, in my primary classes, we used to sing it. So, what's that? Beautiful word. You know, gay. I used to describe people, he's very happy and gay. He's a joyous fellow, you know. And he's oozing with the happiness, you see. Joy, he's a gay fellow, you know, very happy and gay, joy, joyous fellow. That's yeah. what we meant. Yeah. Now, as I'm growing older, I'm reading in the newspapers for the first times the word gay appearing. But I don't get the joke. You know, something to say about gay in our newspapers. Well, uh, say after my teens, maybe around the twenties, when I was around twenty, twenty-five, going on. I'm reading the word gay and it doesn't seem to click in my mind with what I know about gay. But still I don't catch the joke. What is it all about? I don't know, you see. And it carries on and on and on, gay, gay, gay. I'm getting more and more shocks. 
and it took me a long time to know what they're talking about. They're talking about sodomites. Okay? But now they use the word gay. But it was an innocent word. Now I can't say Mr. Mark and John are very <laughs> gay people. <laughs> I, I can't. You're going to take <laughs> yeah. it as an offense. And it, is. it should rightly be taken as an offense. So in its origin, the word is good, beautiful, gay, comrade. But in time, it acquires other connotations. And once it happens, we say we drop it. From our normal usage, we drop it. As a technical term for sodomites, it's still okay, it's okay, but not for our relationship. You know, you find Mr. D that you're so happy. You know, you just find the one. A happy and a joyous fellow. But <laughs> you don't use that other word. <laughs> so, same thing to the word father. Oh. Beautiful term, beautiful term. But now, it has been contaminated with the idea of the only begotten son. See, Jesus is the only begotten son. And in your catechism, I don't know whether the Baptists have a different catechism to that of the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church. I don't know whether you have a different catechism. But in the Anglican catechism, it says, Jesus is the only begotten Son. Begotten, not made. You remember reading that? Yeah, John 3.16. No, no, no. Oh, but in no, the catechism, no, no. Yeah. In the we catechism. don't see. We don't have those kind no, of teaching no. classes. No. Yeah. Based on John three yeah. sixteen, yeah. they say Jesus is the only begotten Son, begotten, not made. Yeah. Now, when you said begotten, well, look, you said we can explain or we say understand. I say, is this what you mean? Because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. Are you attributing such a quality to God, Mark? You say, no, no, no. I don't mean that. You see you try and explain to me what you understand or what it means. Right. But I said, you see, Mark, you are creating a problem with me now. See, with my people now. We have an understanding when you say begotten, begetting in English is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal terms of sex. Can you attribute such a quality to God? He said, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that. We say, you know, whatever explanation. But now when you say begotten, not made, now you are going out of your way to emphasize what it actually means. Begotten, not made. John, my son. You know, suppose he visits me a number of times, he creates a respect for me, although we are at variance. But still he respects me, I respect him. And I say, John, my son. John, my son. You know, my son. And if we know our families better, I visit him at home one day with my friends. And I'm asking his mom and dad, where's John, my son? He said, no, he's just gone out and be back just now. And John returns. And we Eastern people, like Arabs and Jews, we embrace one another. And, you know, we kiss one another. Right. We sit down to chat. My companion, who doesn't know our relationship, is asking me, is he really your son? I said, no. This young man, he loves me like a father, like an old uncle, like a grandfather. He calls me dad, grandpa, whatever he calls me. And I call him a son. No problem. John, no problem. I know John won't object, his mom and dad won't object. But instead I said, yes, he's my begotten son. Now if he understands English, he knows what it means. I said, yes, he's my begotten son. What am I saying? He said, uncle, what did you say? I said, no, no I don't mean that. He's asking, what, what, what are you trying to imply? What are you insinuating? I said, no, 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 John, I don't mean that what you are thinking of what it means. I'm not, uh, but I'm still telling my companion, doesn't he look like my Yusuf at home? What am I saying? I'm saying he's a bastard. This is in the most beautiful language. You are my only begotten son. You know, he's begotten by me. Shh. Term sounds so endearing. You know, sounds so nice, you know. But actually I'm swearing you in the most diplomatic manner. <laughs> that you are a bastard. And again and again I'm repeating, he looks like my son means I had something to do with his mother. He's a bastard. Can you see? So I says, now words now, they over a period use, use in a certain manner, it creates other meanings, connotations. So this connotation now, the Muslim objects very strongly. He says, no, no, don't talk like that. You see, in our worldly affairs, we are more circumspect, respectful in what we say. Uh, in, um, my people, I won't when I visit you home, see your wife, I say, hello, my dear, darling, sweetheart. We don't do that. 
maybe you people, the Western nations, you know, you get used to that time, you know, you call somebody, your friend's wife, hello, my dear, my darling, my sweetheart. <laughs> you say, you pinch her. I said, we don't do that, you see. We are still particular with the terms that you use. So when we are so circumspect with regards to the terminology we use between ourselves, we ought to be. Don't call people by any help the way you like, you know, you address the people with respect, Mr. D, Dad, or, you know, uncle, or whatever it is. You don't just come along and see the guy, you know, roughshod, as you like uh, the old guys used to do, you know, you coulie, you this and that. You don't do that. Maybe what you have in your heart, that's your business between you and God Almighty. But between our own relationship, it says, no, 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 you don't use certain terms of expression. So this term, Father, is removed from the termino religious terminology of Islam never used because it's contaminated. Otherwise, to me, the loving Father in heaven, though you say that the, there are people where as soon as you say Father, the fathers have been molesting their own children. Yeah. They're old, three-year-olds and five-year-old daughters and their sons. I've been reading Father sodomizing their own sons, not stepsons, own sons. And regular church goer at that. Yeah? In the community, the guy is a very, very good fellow. He's a very religious guy. You know, he's, he never misses church services. But the guy is sodomizing his three-year-old and five-year-old children. So you talk to him about the fa loving father. He's got some other pictures. Father. So, you know, how the mind reacts. So, fortunately, I think for the Muslims, this term is eschewed. Is, is we don't use the term. But to me, as a, by itself, I said nothing wrong with the term, except that it is now contaminated. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That was a good answer. <laughs> I have another question. Yes, ma'am. Please. About, I know that, uh, in fact, Craig, when we were here, I'd I hope you get a chance to uh, view that uh, video. I, I will. I just I'm, can't. I know you're busy. But uh, Craig was uh, asking, I think a young man was Mohammed that was with Mohammed us Mohammed Sayyid, yes, we have a young uh, man. Yes, very nice Mohammed young man. Sayyid. Nice young man. And then the other African chap we talked to on the second Omar, day. Omar, I think. Omar, Adam, the yeah, one, Adam. Omar, one of the shortest chap. The one Omar. that's doing the translation. Uh, Omar, that's yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, are there, anyway, Craig and uh, Warren, the photographer, bought, each bought a copy of the uh, translated Quran. Quran. Yes. One of the questions we had, I don't think was sufficiently answered. Isn't it, is it not true that among many Muslims, they, they think the Quran should not be translated in English, is that right? No, no, what it is, that it can't be translated. Yeah. Any religious literature, any religious literature for that matter, spiritual matters, you can't really translate. Yeah. You are trying to give you an approximate something. meaning. Yeah, right. Approximate meaning. So this translation, I think the man says, this is the meaning of the glorious Quran, right? Actually, it's what we said, translation, but the guy, he won't say this is a translation because the language is so rich. Hebrew or Greek, suppose the thing was said in the original language, yeah. you can't actually translate that because in the original language what it means, like the Englishman speaking about his beautiful fiance, he says she is a peach. She is a peach. I know he, what he means is that she is a picture of perfection in looks, in behavior, she is perfect. That's what he's trying to say. Your fiance, she is a peach. Your wife, is a, she is a peach. Nothing wrong with it. But now if I translate that into Zulu, so umgake, I'm a peaches. You know, his wife is a peaches. Or in Afrikaans, I don't know, hey fro, is a pescus. So damn it, all these English people, you know, says, they have peaches for wives, three shillings a dozen. <laughs> is that the worth of his wife? <laughs> no, no, no. See, I have to understand that in the language that the person is speaking, what is he trying to tell me? Like Jesus Christ is talking in, in the ditch. Jewish uh, phrases and uh, terminology, he says, let the dead bury the dead. So the problem arises. How can dead people bury dead people? Right? So if you, if you didn't have an understanding, it's a problem and it will remain there. You know, in practical, how can dead people come out of the grave if your father died? I said, look, let the dead bury the dead. That's what he told that young man, you know, uh, when he came to him and said, now look, uh, what must I do? So he told him, keep the laws and the commandments. He said, look, I have kept it from my childhood. Then he says, look, um, he tried to be too clever. So he said, now, look, sell everything you have got and follow me. Right? You have done everything, now you want something higher than that. The only thing is now, dedicate yourself full time. 
for the work of God. So because of his much speaking, he got caught out. You see, he said, no, I'm perfect, you know, I keep the laws and the commandments and everything I do, now what? He said, now we'll sell your guns and follow me. <laughs> so now, he says, look, but my father has died. You know, let me go and bury him and then I will come back. He's, he's, he's getting out of the difficulties. Once he's gone, he's gone. But now it's embarrassing now what to say. So he said, I'll go and bury my father. So Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Because I understand and maybe I think you understand what he's trying to say. But now, literally, it's a nonsensical. How can dead people bury dead people? Or seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So what language is that? You seeing me, you seeing Mr. D, that, and you say you don't see. And you're hearing me and you say you don't hear. And you don't understand. What is he talking about? So we have to understand now, the mere translation without an understanding in the background says now what the man is implying in his language to his people. What did it convey to them if they were trying to receive that message properly without wanting to find false? Or oh, you can find false with anything. But what did it mean? So similarly, similarly, a translation is a translation. But we are more fortunate than any other religious groups that we have the, the same Quran still available. So, we said, now let's see now, this man translates it like this. Yes, but the Quran is there. I said, look, this Arabic word, I mean, of course, you go to the, uh, the Greek dialogue and you have to, but now here is side by side with us all the time, almost all the time, you know, every translation is there. Then somebody else translated it with a difference in words. So he says, now, uh, yeah, what is the original word here? I said, look, that other person is closer to the meaning of what the Quran is trying to say, what God is trying to say, than so and so. His understanding might have been different. He's limited. Uh -huh. Like I saw a translation uh, of this Quranic verse, we are told, do not marry mushrik women until they believe. Means idolatrous women. Don't marry them until they believe. A slave woman who believes is better for you as a spouse, as a wife, than a mushrik woman, an adulterous woman. Even if she allures you, she fascinates you. This is, and you Muslim men, don't allow your daughters to marry mushriks, idol, idol worshippers, until they believe, until they're converted. A slave man who believes is better for you as your brother-in-law, as your son-in-law, than a mushrik, an idolatrous person even if he's the Prime Minister of the country. So what? They are inviting you to hellfire, whereas Allah is inviting you to his Jannah, his paradise and his forgiveness. Why do you leave this and go for that? Right. Now, that's a translation which I understand. An idolatrous person, mushrik, mushrik, one who associates other persons with God, mushrik. So I, I see an, a translation by an Arab. He uses the word pagan. Say, do not marry pagan women. Now the pagans of Makkah were idolatrous people. But now today the word pagan doesn't mean that. In our usage here, I don't know whether in America what it means or among the Arabs, but when we are talking about pagans, you said, look, um, there are so many Christians among the Africans and there are so many pagans among the Africans. There may be some who have converted to Islam, but the major part is Christian and pagan. In Africa, the Africans, you find majority of them are either Muslims, Christians or pagans. You heard the term pagan? Yes, sir. Right. It's used commonly. So pagan doesn't mean an idol worshipper because no African south of the Zambezi ever worship idols. They didn't worship idols. They had a concept of God which to me is one of the noblest concepts of God, the Africans had, long before the white man came here. You see, the African Zulu, he called God Almighty Umvelingangi, Umvelingangi. So I'm asking him, what is Umvelingangi? That's the term he uses for God Almighty in his language. So he tells me, he said, Nimzan, sir, we are in Umoya, Umwele, he is the pure and holy spirit. Agazali and Afuti Agazalwanga, he does not beget and is not begotten. And there is nothing like unto him. That's right. That is the highest concept you can have of God. 
It's not like anything you can think or imagine. It's not like a man or a monkey or an elephant. But the only thing is that he hasn't accepted Christianity. So the Christians call him pagan. I says, no, he's a true believer in God. To me, he's nearer to God than you. With apologies. You see? <laughs> then my Hindu cousins. They worship men and monkeys, elephants and snakes. This African didn't do that. The you, the white people, you gave the Zulus a name to call his brother, who does not, who doesn't go to church, who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. You see, but he believes in God. Mm -hmm. He knows the the Ten Commandments. He knows ethics and morality. He knew before the white man came here. He knew that Ugu Pinga into AMP he says, uh, uh, adultery was evil, talking lies was evil, murder was evil. All this he knew before the white mass came here. But you still call him pagan. I say he's not a pagan. See, he's a true man of God. He's closer to me than you are. You are closer to me in so many other respects as a Christian. I'm also closer to the Jew in so many respects. But this guy in the concept of God, he's the closest to me than you. And you call him a pagan? So now that guy translates as pagan. I says, no, 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 no. It's a wrong translation. No, I mean the wrong term you used. Because the minds of the people that the Africans are pagan. That my daughter can't marry an African. No, it doesn't say that. Or a Bushman or a Hottentot. He believes in God. He's not a pagan. So, the correct translation would have been an idolatrous person. Do not marry idolaters. As the Bible says in the book of Leviticus, and an idolater or an idolatrous, thou shalt not marry. That's right. We hold on to that. Idolater, taking other beings as gods, those people you don't marry. You don't marry them and you don't allow their sons to marry your daughters. This is, so, choice of words. Now in the choice of word, now fortunately because the word is there, mushrik, so I know what mushrik means. It does, the word pagan doesn't convey that. But to the man who translated it, in his mind, all the Hindus are, mush are pagans. I said, no, they're not pagans. They are idol worshippers, but they're not pagans in the sense we're using for the African people in Africa. These Africans are not pagans. I, I yes, think, uh, yes, Mark. Yes, Mark. You're making yes, Mark. point very clear, and I think I understand it that we do have problems, you know, coming from one language to the other. Yes, yes. Mark. Is one of the, and we face the same thing coming from the Greek and the Hebrew right, into right, English right. and that kind of thing. As white as snow. Yeah. What does the guy in Central Africa know what is snow? Yeah, okay. Uh, so you have to give him the white of the coconut. <laughs> you know, like the white of the coconut, you see. My real, my real question yes. in that regard is, is one of the aims of the Islamic Propagation Center to get the Koran into the hands of a common person who who may in his lifetime never have the chance to learn Arabic uh, with yes. skill and yes. given some of the dangers or problems of translation, you know, at least to get close to the correct, correct. to the message. No. Is that one of the things correct. that you're about here to correct. try to we want to see that popularize, shall I, I say? If yeah. I can make it possible for every Zulu, every Khaza, every Joanna, if I can have the Quran available to him in his mother tongue, I would go out to do that. Yeah. As well as to the English speaking people okay. and the African speaking people. Now to me, this message is a message for mankind. See, the very first verse of the Qur'an, the very first verse is not addressed to Arabs or Muslims. It says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, the cherisher, sustainer, evolver of the translation of mankind. That's also it's a translated mankind. I said, no, it's not mankind. It's Alameen. Alam in Arabic means the world, and Alamin means the worlds, the universe. That's the actual word. But now for convenience sake, uh, the man translates as the worlds, uh, mankind. Praise be to God, the cherisher and sustainer of the, his God is here. Worlds. I said, right. Somebody would say, mankind. I said, look, you translate it. I won't fight with you. I said, okay. You mean well. But the actual word in Arabic is worlds. And our translator, he says here, the Arabic word, uh, right, we express only one aspect of it when we say, in humility, 
God cares for all the words. The Arabic word Rabb, usually translated Lord, has also the meaning of cherishing, sustaining, bringing to maturity. God cares for all the worlds He has created. There are many worlds, astronomical and physical worlds, worlds of thought, spiritual worlds and so on. In every one of them, God is all in all. We express only one aspect of it when we say, in Him we live and move and have our being. The mystical division between number one, Nasut, the human world knowable by the senses, two, Malakut, the invisible world of angels, and three, Lahut, the divine world of reality, requires volume, a whole volume to explain it. Right. So the, in his Arabic, it's, it's talking about the universe. So we said, now somebody said, of mankind. I said, okay, you know, possible. But then says, now mankind, what about uh, when we reach the other planets and we find another planet on whom there are other creatures, uh, intelligent enough that we can communicate with, what about for them? They are not mankind. You know, mankind, we understand uh, what we are. But there might be some other type of creatures, quite intelligent, maybe like the ants, you know, our size. And they are ruling that, that part of the world. What about for them? They are ant kind, they're not mankind. As, is it for them as well? So yes, this book says yes, it's also for them. It's not for Arabs, or for Jews, or for white or blacks, it's for them. All the world. So are you, uh, are you seen among many of the Muslim world is somewhat of a uh, progressive term I'm using uh, or what I'm, I'm saying for aren't you non-traditional in your desire to put the words of the Quran into the vernacular of the common people the common you know so like you said so the Kosa and Zulu Swana is that not a sort of a new thing uh for you to be taking this approach. No, no, and please, I'm not trying to trip you no, up in no, any no, way. No, I'm no, just no. asking a question. To me, Mark, any question that's put to me, in all honesty, I must accept it that you're asking in all sincerity, and yeah. I must, to the best of my ability, respond to okay. it in all sincerity. It is, uh, there's no catch as catch can, you know. Okay. Says, I want to catch you out or you want to catch me out. I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. Man, you might ask me something very silly. To me, it's not silly. Okay. Maybe it's your background is making you to say those things that in a uh, in a silly form. You know? But I said, no, no, no. I think you mean well, unless you persist. When I pointed out to you, I said, no, Mark. You say, look, man, this is not fair. You're hitting me under the belt, and you still insist. Then I said, no, this guy is out for mischief. Otherwise, shh, I accept it. Okay. You see, the message is for the whole of mankind. That's what the Quran says. Yeah. And uh, because of that reverence we have for the Quranic Arabic which we believe is the word of God, literally given. You see, unlike the, the Bible now, as the Christians believe, was inspired by God. Holy men, they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what they were moved to write. And they wrote in their own words, according to the word, maybe the vocabulary at their disposal, uh, they wrote down according to their own background experience. They're trying to put into words what God, we say, tickle them. Whatever they were tickled to say or to do, they did it, but in their own words. The words are the words of men, even if inspired by God. See? That means that your humanity comes in, into what you are transcribing. The Quran, we believe, is not like that. See? The Holy Prophet Muhammad, he was no prophet then, at the age of 40. He happened to be in a cave some three miles north of the city of Mecca. It was, according to our history now, it was the 27th of the month of Ramadan. It's our fasting month. There was no fasting month then. This was a seasonal month of the Arabs. And he's in the cave alone, and he sees a vision in which the archangel Gabriel commands him in his mother tongue, Iqra, which means to read. Muhammad being unlearned, naturally, he's terrified and he says, Ma ana He said, I'm not learned. Like I said, I give you an Arabic verse, read, Mark. <laughs> he said, Uncle, I'm not learned in that. I'm not learned. So the angel commands him a second time, Iqra, read. And again he says, Ma ana He said, I'm not learned. For the third time, the angel of God says, Iqra, bismi rabbika allazi halak. Read in the name of the Lord and cherisher who created. 
So Muhammad now grasps that what he was required to do was to repeat. Because this Arabic word Iqra means to read, to decide, to rehearse, to repeat. It has all those senses. But he was thinking of the first primary sense, read. It is also to repeat. So he repeated the words. Iqra bismi rabbin alazi khalak. Sakhalak al insana min alak. He said, He who created man from a mere plot of congealed blood. So Muhammad says, Khalak al insana min alak. He said, Iqra wa rabbuka al akram. He said, Read and the Lord is most bountiful. So he said, Iqra wa rabbuka al akram. He said, Allah the Allah bil kalam. He said, He who taught the use of the pen. So he said, Allah the Allah bil kalam. He said, Allah al insana malam yalam. Taught man that which he knew not. So he said, Allah al insana malam yalam. These were the first five verses revealed to him. And as soon as the angel departed, sweating all over, terrified, and he runs back home some three miles out to Mecca, to his dear wife, Khadija, and he says, cover me up, cover me up. So she covers him up. When he gets out of his excitement, he explains to her what he had seen and what he had heard, fearing that something has gone wrong. Because he was not bargaining for this. This was not a graduating ceremony that he was now prepared for, the gowning ceremony, and you look forward to it. He was not looking forward to any such experiences, so he's terrified. He's terrified. He said, no, we talk about people being possessed. Maybe something has gone wrong with me now. So she assures him, he said, no, God will not allow such a thing to happen to you. Mm -hmm. Now, these five verses, you open it in the Qur'an, they are not the first verses of the Qur'an. They are the 96th chapter. That's amazing. He said, now, I'll show you what is the difference now. People are having a problem with the Qur'an because we are thinking in human terms, in our own experiences, every book on earth, I'm telling you now, religious book is on a once upon a time basis. Once upon a time, once upon a time, once upon a time. You know, that type of language, the fox and the grape, the wolf and the lamb. That is the level on which every book is talking. First thing starts first. In the beginning, God created the heavens. This is how a book ought to begin. You see? In the beginning was the word. And this is how. The, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. This is how all biographies begin. All biographies. This is how they start. Ahmad Dida, born in 1918 in a village in India, this district, that, 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 you know, to uh, Hussein Didat and Fatima, so and so. So, this is how all stories begin. This thing is something unusual. All of a sudden, so you see this first revelation, you ask anybody, Muslim and non-Muslim, they tell you this was the first revelation. But where is it? Now you look, start looking for it in the Quran and you can't find it. Because where are you looking for it? The beginning, you at, look at the beginning, is not there. So, if you ask somebody who knows, he says, no, it is the 96th chapter. 90, 92, 96. It starts. This is how it starts. The chapter starts. The chapter starts. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Start. Iqra bism rabbika allazi khalaq. And the translation, proclaim or read in the name of the Lord and cherish your Creator. Khalaq al insana min Allah created man out of a mere cloud of. When you read this, you find there's nothing about what I told you just now. I said, you see, he was in a cave, some three miles north of the city of Makkah. He was 40 years old. And uh, he used to retire to this place for peaceful fight and contemplation, worrying about the problems of his people. Right. And on the 27th of the month of Ramadan, when he's alone, he sees this vision. And he's terrified. And this is how he responded. But when you read here, it's not there. All the story is not there in the Quran. It's not there. It just starts. Iqra bism rabbika allazi khalaq. Khalaq al insana min alak. Iqra wa rabbuka al akram. Allazi allama bil kalam. Allama al insana ma'alam ya'alam. It just starts like that. When the first word Iqra was given to him, he says, ma'ana biqari. He said, I'm not learned. It's not there. Again, say Iqra. So he said, I'm not learned. It's not there. Why is it not there? Because that's the word of Muhammad. Muhammad said that. This is the word of God. What did God say? Through the archangel, what did he say? He said, Iqra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alak, ikra wa rabbuka al akram, allazi allama bi... Muhammad's words are not there. The historian tells me 
that he was 40 years old. The historian tells me that this was his habit of retiring to that place. The historian tells me that he was terrified. And he ran home to his wife and he was sweating all over and he asked his wife to cover him up. And she, who told me that? God? No. So, this is the book that creates this problem for the reader. The unbeliever. He doesn't know what is this. All of a sudden, there's nothing there. There's no details. I said, you see, because this is the word of God. This book is only God's word. The rest is Muhammad, he spoke. These are books of traditions, hadiths. Then our historians, we have other our learned men putting up another set of books. Everything is separate in the house of Islam. But now it's too concentrated for you. Now this first verse, first revelation I mean, of the Quran, is a, is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12, it reads, And the book is given to him that is not learned. Saying, read, iqra. And he says, ma ana bi qarin. He said, I'm not learned. This, you read any biography of Muhammad, and you'll find these words there. That the book, when the book, the revelation is given to him, he says, I'm not learned. So he says, read. He says, no, I'm not learned. Where is this? I say, in the book of Isaiah. Did Muhammad read the book of Isaiah? He said, now look, this is what I must do now. You see, when the angel comes to me, and if he tells me, read, I'm going to tell him, I'm not learned. Because this is what Isaiah wrote. Did Muhammad know the book of Isaiah? Was there an Arabic Bible available in his lifetime? There wasn't. It was a thousand years after Jesus, for the first time the Arabic Bible was written. The Arabic Bible came into existence. So, no, no, he said, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, I have this type of Thank you. understanding, so I'm trying to share with people. I said, look, this book, you are finding difficulty with the book, because it's not a storybook of the life of Muhammad. You read the four Gospels, there are the life story of Jesus. A short one, but all the four are trying to give you, in their own words, what happened to Jesus during the three years of his ministry. This book here, you take this whole, whole vast volume, and you do not find Muhammad's father's name in here. His mother's name is not here. His wife's name is not here. His daughter's name is not here. None of his, the Khalifas, you know, who became the successors of Muhammad, Abu Bakr, Omar, Osman, Ali, their names are not here. What kind of a book is this? In this vast volume, the name Muhammad occurs four times, and the word Ahmad, another alternative for Muhammad, occurs once. Five times is mentioned by name, Muhammad, in this vast volume, in the Arabic text. The name Jesus, in this very book, 25 times. He is five times more important. Is that what it means? Look, Jesus is mentioned by name, by name, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus and Mary, 25 times. Muhammad, altogether five times. Jesus is mentioned 25 times. There is a chapter in the Quran called Surah Maryam, chapter Mary in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. There is no such chapter in the name of his mother's name. Amina, or his wife's name Khadija, or Aisha, or his daughter Fatima. There's nothing. Two places this, in this Quran is the Annunciation, the good news about the birth of Jesus, is given to Mary. Two separate places in the Quran. But Muhammad's birth is not mentioned. So now the question is why? Why? Why should this book be like that? The man himself, if you write a book, you write a letter, an epistle, you can't help starting with, I am very happy, or I have great pleasure, and I this and I that, that I, you can't leave out. You and me, all of us. Quite a, a strange book from that point of view. It is difficult for a person because you are looking for a certain uh, form that you are used to. I was used to, at one time, reading Aladdin and his wonderful lamb, and I seen by the sailor, and I was quite an expert, and I had a love for reading all that. And wherever I went to, to the families, they would tell me, start a story, tell us a story. So invariably I started with once upon a time. Though even I created my own concoction. I said, once upon a time. I thought this was like a religious thing that you have to, you have to say once upon a time. Uh. Although I'm creating the story myself because I read that. Once upon a time, Aladdin. Once upon a time, this. Once upon a time. That's how I was reading almost all the fairy tales. So now, you want a, a story from me, how do I start? 
I said, once upon a time. I just can't imagine a person can start a story without once upon a time. Now I know we can. Okay? But now this is how. So you, once you are used to a certain format, it's very difficult for you to grasp what all of a sudden you start reading and man is talking about I just open it at random. To them and to their fathers and progeny and brethren, we chose them and we guided them for to a straight way. This is the guidance of God. He giveth that guidance to whom He pleaseth. Of His worshippers, if they were to join other gods with Him, all that they did would be vain for them. But it's not a story. You know, it's not a story. You can't seem to be sure. Say, O ye, ye men, if ye are in doubt as to my religion, behold, I worship not what ye worship other than God, but I worship God. Who will take your souls at death? I am commanded to be in the ranks of the believers. He opened. Then when he turned his face towards the land of Madian, he said, I do hope that my Lord will show me the smooth and straight path. This is about Moses. But now, you read like this, is, this is not the type of book that you have been reading. It's a problem for you. Because everything you read, like if I quote you from the book of Genesis, any story, you can't forget in a hundred years. In a hundred years you'll never forget. Genesis chapter 38. I said, you see, Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we get the word Judea and Judaism, Judah, the elder son of Jacob. He had three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. And when Er was big enough to get married, he got a daughter-in-law called Tamar. He got him married. Er, to Tamar. And something Er did, he erred in the sight of the Lord, so God killed him. So according to Jewish custom, if one brother dies, leaving no offspring, then the second fellow takes the widow to wife and he gives her a child so that the name of the deceased can carry on. That is where the feeling that the, your name must not perish. Mm. So somebody must help you out to see that your name carries on. So according to the system, he tells Onan, his second son, he said, look, you go in and to your brother's wife and beget child by her so that the name of your deceased brother can carry on. So according to custom, he goes in and to his brother's wife, meaning having sex with her, and while he's about to ejaculate, the thought occurs to him that the seed is mine, but my brother is going to get the credit. Who's going to get the credit? My brother. So he spills it on the ground, his seed. So God killed him also. That's what the book says. So Judah tells his daughter-in-law Tamar, twice widowed now, he said, look, you go and stay at your father's house, and when Shelah, the third fellow, is grown, I will call you. But conveniently, the old man forgot. Conveniently. Because at the back of the mind, he's superstitious. He says, you know, because of this woman, this witch, you know, the old people says, a bloody witch. You know, she ate up my one son, because of her he died, and because of her the second fellow died. So the third fellow, his life might also be in danger. So the best thing is to just forget about it. Now the woman is waiting, and she sees Shela is grown, and maybe he's already married to another woman. Polygamy was not a crime, so you know, he could have still done his duty. So she wants to take revenge. So she gets the news that the old man, Judah, was going to Timna to share his sheep. So she goes and sits by the wayside. She knew the road that the old man was going to take. And the old man, Judah, while passing, he sees this woman sitting by the roadside covering her face. So he comes up to her thinking she is a harlot, a whore, a prostitute. So he comes up to her and he says, allow me, I'm only quoting the Bible now, allow me to come in and to thee. Let me have sex with you. So she says, what will that give me? So he said, I'll give you a kid from the flock, goat kid. She said, what guarantee is that I will give it? You know, you have fun and damn it all, you might not send it. What guarantee is there that you are going to give it? He said, what guarantee do you want? Pledge. So she said, your signet, your ring and your bracelet, maybe the old, older days, there used to be bracelets on the arm, and your rod that is in your hand. So the old man gave it to her and he had intercourse, committed incest with his daughter-in-law and immediately she became pregnant. The two sons, they failed. This old man, one hit twins. Twins were in her womb. Then he gets a three months gone and now she's carrying. So people can see, he says, look, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. He gets the news. So he says, call the bitch. He says, I'll burn her. Call her. 
So they bring Tamar to the old man. But before he can confront her, she sends with a servant, he said, look, give this to my father-in-law, that this rod and this bracelet and ring are belonging to the guy who's responsible for my condition. So when the old man sees, he says, hey, she's more righteous than I, and he had no more intercourse with her, only one intercourse with her, he had. Then the time for childbirth has arrived, and the nurse is waiting, jealously, to see that, you know, don't do any injustice to the, one of the twins, because according to Jewish law, the firstborn gets the inheritance, or he's the head of the family, the firstborn. So she is now waiting. Which one came out first? And the first guy puts his hand out to, through his mother's womb, and she ties the scarlet thread. Maybe it was too sensitive, so he puts it back, and then the other guy comes out. So she calls his name Fares. Fares means the guy who bursts the queue, breaks the queue, pushing others out of the way. And then came out his brother with the scarlet thread, so she called him Zara. Zara means red in Hebrew, it means because he had the scarlet thread. This story, Mark and John, look, you can't forget. He says, I went to do that, and you know, among so many things we chatted, uh, what he spoke about this old man Judah, and he sees a woman sitting by the roadside, thinking she is a whore. So he goes up to her and he bargains with her, and she allows, you know, for get with these pledges, and he has intercourse. And she, twins are born. Who are they? Fathers and Sarah. Who are they? They are the great grandfathers of your Lord Jesus Christ. See? First chapter of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. It begins, and this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. And Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas beget Fares and Zara of Tamar. Now that's deep waters. You knew about David, you know about Abraham, you heard about Isaac, you heard about Jacob. But now Fares and Zara of Tamar. Who are they? So you find any Bible which has a cross reference, you look on the side, it's a Genesis chapter 38. So you can read there that the father in law commits incest with his daughter in law, begetting these bastard children. They are the great grandfathers of your God. Jesus Christ. And in the genealogy, six bastards and begetters of bastards in the genealogy of Jesus. I said, a very proud thing to boast about. <laughs> I want to know that, look, you say his father is God. Right? This is the belief of a thousand million, over one billion Christians of the world, that his father is God. But he's not there in the genealogy as given by Matthew and Luke. He's giving you 66 fathers and grandfathers to Jesus Christ in these two genealogies. Out of those 66, God is not one of them. Amazing. He is the son of God, but in the genealogy, God is not mentioned, not once to say that he is anywhere in the picture. But he's given him 66 fathers and grandfathers. And out of his six are bastards and begetters of bastards. Not what I say, the same record, your old record tells you. David, an adulterer. You know. And these guys, and Ruth, Ruth and Boaz in the barn. These are all in the genealogy of Jesus. So I said, now look, we Muslims, I said, look, this book here, it tells us in such a beautiful language the birth of Jesus, his genealogy in a few words. Generally people don't want to read it. You're looking for, said, what can I find that I can hit the Muslim with? I said, look, for a change, what about, said, let me see what does this book say. In the book that you have got, open up J, Jesus, like in a dictionary, in the index, and say, what does it say? First item, it says, a righteous prophet. He's the true prophet of God. Second item, he says, his birth. Chapter 3, verses 45 onwards. Chapter 19, verses 23 onwards. Just read it. That's all. Now, I said, look, his birth. Chapter 3. I just open chapter 3. This is what it says. His birth. This is what it sounds like. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa yustalati al-malaikatu ya Maryamu. Maryamu. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki wa tahharaki wa stafaki ala nisail alameen. That God has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Mary, the mother of Jesus. In the Quran, she is a woman chosen above the women of all nations. 
یا مرج مکنتی لی رب کی وس جدی ور کا ایمار راکین سو او میری ورشیب دائی لوڈ ڈی باؤٹ لی پروسٹریٹ دائی سلف ان باؤ ڈاؤن ان پری وی دوزو باؤ ڈاؤن فیالی کمی نمبائی لغائی بی This is part of the tidings of the things unseen, which we reveal unto thee, O Apostle, by inspiration. Thou was not with them when they cast lots with arrows, as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary, nor was thou with them when they disputed the point. What's all this? The story is that the mother of Mary, she had vowed, she was barren for a long period. So she vowed that, O oh my Lord, if you give me a child, I will offer this child for temple services, dedicated to the temple for the service of God. And God heard her prayer. In time she became pregnant and she delivered the child. And when the child was delivered she was shocked because it's a girl and the female is very unlike the male for temple services. What is she to do? She had vowed. So when the child is big enough that she can look after herself, she takes this child to the temple, synagogue in, in Jerusalem or wherever. And everybody sees this beautiful child. Everybody says, I'll be a godfather. You know, I'll look after this child. You know, this baby, give it to me. So everybody's, everybody's clamoring for the child. So they said, look now, the only way is we can toss it out. Toss it out now. You know, in the old days, they said, casting lots. Like head or tail, I would you toss the coin. This was a casting of lots. So according to the casting of lots, it came to the turn of Zechariah, that Zechariah won the toss. So when he won the toss, there's an argument. He said, no, no, you cheated. Said, Mark, you know, you were not fair. This is what we do all the time. So God is telling Muhammad, he said, look, you were not there when they cast lots with arrows as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary, nor were you there when they disputed the point. How do you know about these things? He said, this is what we're giving to you by inspiration. Now, either you accept it or reject it. But I said, now when you reject it, you have to give a reason. This man, Muhammad, He is making us to believe that Mary was a woman chosen above the women of all nations. I am asking why would an Arab go out of his way to provoke other Arabs? Because he wasn't talking to me, an Indian, or to the African. No, no he was talking to other Arabs, his own people. Telling them that the Jewess, the mother of Jesus, she was chosen above the women of all nations. Not his own mother, or wife or daughter, or another Arab woman, but a Jewess. When the Jews were looking down upon the Arabs for 3,000 years, they still look down upon the Arab cousins today. And yet this Arab is honoring a Jewess. Account for that. When he's surrounded by Jews and Christians, and the Jews were a power around Medina, not the Christians. And yet he's telling and he's provoking the Jews also. They say this woman, immoral woman, you know, a Jewish, a Roman soldier raped her. Hmm? He says, no, this man Muhammad says, no, she was a virtuous woman, she was a true servant of God, godly person, saintly person, and she was chosen above the women of all nations. I say, you account for that now. When you say Muhammad wrote the book, I want you to account for that. Why would he go out of his way to provoke his own people and provoke the Jews? He was no lunatic. <laughs> he was, people say, that look, he was a mighty genius. A man who can create a nation and empire and a religion and write a book and create a society. Right? He, was, he was no fool. He was a mighty genius. Then why would he go and do such a silly thing? From the worldly point of view, it's silly. Provoking your own people and provoking the Jews, a power to be reckoned with. Why did he do that? Unless he is inspired by God to say, look, this is the fact. Put it down. He puts it down. It continues. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, God giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter, and of the company of those nearest to God, Jesus, in the company of those nearest to God. What the Christian would say, sitting on the right hand of God, we a right, but not literally. Only thing we said, look, I accept, Mark, what you say, sitting on the right hand of God. You see, in Eastern languages, when you say sitting on the right hand, doesn't mean he's right, sitting on the right hand. He's my right hand man. He's sitting on my left hand side, sitting behind me, but he's my right. In other words, in position of importance, any consultation I do with him, you know. Right. So I said, in the, not geographically, not physically, but in status. He's in the company of those nearest to God. Where you call him nasa, and he will speak to the people, fil mahdi wa kahlan, in childhood and in maturity, women are salihain, and he shall be of the company of the righteous. When this good news is given to her, she says, she said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? 
the Bible says, when I know not a man. See, this choice of words now. But it means the same thing. Whether you say, I know not a man, meaning sexually. She knows other men. You know, the human, our father, or our, she knows, but when she means, I know not a man. She, no man has touched me. Doesn't mean nobody has ever touched her. It means sexually. It's a choice of words the Bible uses, the choice of words the Quran uses. But the answers to that are revealing. See, the Quran says that when she said, how can this thing be when no man has touched me? So the answer is, the angel says in reply, Even so, Allah creates what He wills. Whenever He decrees a matter, He merely says to it, be and it is. For God to create a Jesus without a human father, just like that. To create a million Jesuses without mother, without father, just like that. But who will look after those little ones? Who will change the napkins? Jesus needed a mother. Right? This is what the Quranic story is. And we believe. No question. Thousand million Muslims in the world, we believe this. No question, no arguments. But the, your Anglican bishops don't believe, we believe. Right? Now you contrast this. See, I was in, in Johannesburg. And I went to the Bible house, I was looking for an Indonesian Bible. See, I have a, a hobby of learning foreign languages. If I go to any country, I try and master some words in that language. So I get all these Bibles. I have the Indonesian Bible. I have the Hausa Nigerian Bible. You know, I keep on getting these things so that I can, as soon as I come to your country, you speak French, I want to learn something in French. So I can rattle it off to you, opening your heart to me. So I was looking for an Indonesian Bible. Our Bible house didn't have it. So when I go to Johannesburg, and uh, I, I find the Bible, and I was looking for another New Testament Greek English. I think it's here somewhere. Ah, this one here. Oh. The New Testament in English, uh, Greek and English. So I was looking through that, and uh, the supervisor. All the supervisors of Bible houses are retired reverends. I don't know whether you know. Only retired reverends become uh, supervisors of... No, no, this... Uh, the man is retired, you know. He can sit back and see what's going on there. No. So this man comes up to me, an elderly gentleman, compared to me there. I was clean shaven. I had that uh, Jinnah cap, you know, the one that they, the, the Pakistanis wear, or like the Russians, you know. I had that type of a thing on. And he sees me handling that book and the other book. So he comes up to me and he starts a conversation. Because this was quite expensive in those days, you know. Uh, maybe it was 15 rands or so. But it was very expensive. The Bible was about two and three and six each. We used to get the Bible. Your whole Bible, about three and six. Three shillings and six rands, 35 cents. We used to get that. So compared to that, this was 15 rands was a lot of money. I think it was about 15 rands. So he says, why did I select these books? He says, no, I'm doing comparative religion. And uh, I saw something of interest, so I bought the book. I want to take it. He said, you mind having a cup of tea with me? I said, not at all. So he took me into his office and he ordered some tea. So he wanted to know more. So I told him that, look, we believe in Jesus. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind and the living. All this I'm telling him. And it's all news to him. He's a retired reverend. But as if, you know, all this, I'm, I'm, it's a favor, I'm, I'm just trying to thrill him, you know. So I said, you know what the Quran says? He says, no. So I read this. I know by heart. I read it to him and I gave the explanation. When I came to this point, that for God to create just like that. He said, look, this is the same as my Bible. I said, yes, on the face of it, it's the same. On the face of it, it's the same. But I said, if you read it, uh, you know, intently, I said, you'll find that the difference between this and yours is chalk and cheese. So what do you mean? I said, look, here, when she says, how can this thing happen to me, have a child, when no man has touched me, physically, sexually. Right? So the same thing is repeated in the Gospel of St. Luke. How can this thing be when I know not a man? No man has touched me. I said, it means the same. But what, what is the answer to that? The book, this book says, just like that. For God to create, He wills it and the thing comes into being. Your book, what does it say? What did the angel say? Do you remember? Ask you... Uh, no, look, 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 chapter 2 or 3. It says, and the Holy Ghost will come upon thee. Oh, yeah. 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. So I said, you see, we are trying to say the same thing. We are both. We want to say the same thing. That this was a miraculous birth. But the language that you're using is down to a gutter language. And the Holy Ghost will come on you. How? Like a bull going on a cow? Or a man <laughs> going on his wife? No, no, the language. Yeah. You see? And the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. How? Like a man overshadowing his wife? Like Ruth in the, and Boaz in the barn. She said, come cover me up. What is she saying? Come and have sex with me. Yeah. To cover her means to have sex. Yeah. And he covered her means he had sex. Right? The Holy Ghost and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. I said, you are giving a weapon, a stick, to the atheist and the agnostic to beat you with. <laughs> how? How? How did the Holy Ghost... The Holy Ghost is a person. Right? Mm. He said, yes. So this person came on Mary to impregnate her. That's what Billy Graham said. And the Holy Ghost came. This is how he did it in King's Park. I was there. And impregnated Mary like this. That's what he did. In those days, I don't know, there were no videos. You know, when he came, Billy Graham came to King's Park. He came and impregnated her. I said, that's a language you're using because of your reading. The Holy Ghost came on her. Power of the Most High overshadowed her. I said, now between these two versions, the Quranic and the Biblical, both are trying to say the same thing. That Jesus was born miraculously. But the language in which you are saying it, and the language in which the Quran says, I said, which would you prefer to give to your daughter? The Quranic version or the Biblical version? And this Reverend Dunkers, that was, was a German origin, Reverend Dunkers, he bowed his head down in shame. He said, I would prefer to give the Quranic version. Why? I said, how can an imitation, if this is an imitation, Muhammad forged it. I said, how can an imitation diamond be better than your original Kohinoor? How can I make out of glass a diamond more genuine than your original Kohinoor diamond? Or your dung, what the, Kulinan diamond or whatever. Can you produce out of glass something more genuine than that? Something more sparkling than that? Can you? I think not. No. So you know, the, the genuine is genuine. Yours is the genuine one, you say. I said, like, this is an imitation. How can this imitation be better than your genuine one? You tell me. Unless your... Yours was also from God, but it was not preserved. That's the only thing. It was not preserved. Moses didn't write those five books. Jesus Christ didn't write the Gospel of Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or John. And your scholars now, they tell me that even Matthew didn't write Matthew. Mark didn't write Mark. Luke, Luke didn't write Luke, and John didn't write John. Your scholars are telling me that. They showed you the internal evidence. He said, look, it doesn't appear that Matthew wrote this book. Why? He said, look, Matthew 9, 9. He is telling us about Jesus that while he was going forth into the way, he saw a tax collector called Matthew. And he, Jesus, came up to him, Matthew, and said unto him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus. And he, uh, Matthew, followed him, Jesus. I said, did Jesus write that? He says, no. Did Matthew write that? He said, no. I said, you see, an eyewitness or a year witness or somebody writing from hearsay. So he said, look, this is not God's word. The Quran is God's word. Verbally, verbally articulated. What was put into him, what he heard, he repeated. The other is, you were tickled, and in your tickling, you have your background, experience, prejudices, and you can't help bringing them in. You edit it. See, mankind, you have a tendency to edit. Like, he tells us, he tells us that while he, Jesus was going for him the way, he saw a fig tree in the distance with leaves, happily he came up to it, waiting to find figs thereon, but he found nothing but leaves. Right? That's one gospel. The other gospel writer repeats word for word. While he was going forth in the way, he saw a fig tree in the distance with leaves. Happily he came up to it, wanting to find figs there, word for word. But when he came up to it, there was nothing but leaves. So, he is writing that, he's copying from a another source, both of them. They have a common source, what they call Q, in German Quella. Both these people, they have access to that and they're both writing from there. But when this man here, Matthew, I think he comes to there, he says, why is it that my Lord, he didn't know? He was deceived into thinking that they were fixed, but there were no fixed. Why? He ought to have known. He says, no, he adds, for the season was not yet. For the, now, that's an addition. Okay? Jesus goes to a certain place and he could do the no mighty works. It means the miracles. Right. So, the editing takes place. Another gospel says, he went there, identical, word for word. You watch Matthew and Mark are at verbatim the same, in some 85% is the same. 
Why? Because they had a common source. But now where they differ, you see everything. Why couldn't they, why couldn't they do any mighty works there? Your Lord. Because you know why? Right! Now that's editing. You know, he said, you add. So he said, look, this is what is happening to your book. In our case, the Quran is separate. Word of God. The word of the Prophet, separate. The word of the historian, separate. They all have their respective values. They are not the same. We don't treat them equally. This is the word of God supreme. Then comes the word of the Prophet. Then comes the word of the historian. And we have many things besides, like the Arabian Nights. It's got nothing to do with the Quran. It's got nothing to do with Islam. You know? pornographic stories were being told down the campfire among the Arabs like among all nations how do you pass time I read that the unexpurgated edition of the Arabian Nights by by Fitzgerald I read it some many years ago very thrilling very thrilling you know what I read um, it was unexpurgated you know it was uncensored in those days you see it was really something right but that's nothing to do with the Quran nothing to do with Islam it just happens that the Arabs had it but now you the Christian world you have in your holy book the word of God is there. The word of the prophet is there. The word of the historian is there. And pornography of the highest order is also there. As a kid, you read there about those hordens of those two sisters, Ahola and Aholiba. Then you read in chapter 16. It's a metaphorically speaking about the Jews. So you are a whore. And you make your your your, your like your platform at every corner, every circus like Oxford Circus, at every corner. And you are not like other prostitutes. The other prostitutes, you have to pay them. You, you pay your, come, here I pay you, come on. And the, the Egyptians, great of flesh, these mighty big, big pigs. And the Syrians, they couldn't satiate you. you are, did you read that? Chapter 16, yeah. as a kid. So, I said, look, man, I can't read it to your sister, your wife, or your daughter. Why? <laughs> because if I did, you say, this guy, this old guy is in a very Lord fellow. <laughs> I'm not, I'm only reading you your holy book. <laughs> and I'm explaining to you, he says, and she doted upon her paramours, her lovers, whose flesh was as the flesh of asses. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they translated, and the genitals were like those of donkeys. <laughs> and the emission was like those of horses. I said, now, your sister, your daughter reading that, if she thinks of God, Ma, tell me, be honest. If she thinks, says, and the pricks were like those of donkey size pricks they had, and they bru bruised the teeth of their virginity. What is that? The clitoris was bruised with what? With your nose, with your tongue, what? What do you bruise it with? The donkey size genitals were like those of donkeys. And I said, now, we Muslims, we said, look, the Jews had all types of writing in Hebrew, you know? And they have the manuscripts, so different, different things written, the stories are written. Like to us now, anything that's written in Arabic, anything that's written in Arabic to my people in Africa, Muslims in Africa or Asia, anywhere, you throw this around and you watch. The Muslim child will find, see, pick it up, kiss it and put it away in the Quran or in the bag. Every Muslim child does it. Every old man. And young man, if he sees this in Arabic, he'll pick it up. But what is this? It could be Lady Chatterley's lover in Arabic. <laughs> huh? It could be a book of pornography in Arabic. The poor man doesn't know. He's taught to respect God's word. To us, because the only God's word we see is in that script, in this script. We don't see other writings, the non-Arab. We don't see. Anything we see in this script must be God's word. So we react, respond to that, like that. The Jew the same. You see, when they wanted to get things together, anything that was written in Hebrew was sacrosanct. What was that written in Hebrew? Anything, everything. Your personal jealousies. You know, everything came in. You read the book of Genesis, chapter 9, after the flood. You read there, uh, God saved Noah and his three sons, Sam, Ham and Japheth. Then they started to grow grapes. And out of the fruit of the vine, they fermented the wine. And Noah drank too much. Remember? Yeah. And he was lying naked. In his drunken state, he was lying naked. So, Ham saw his father's nakedness. And it was a big joke. You know, the old man sprawled out, you know, airing his uh, genitals. It was, you know, a big joke for Ham. But the other two sons, they felt ashamed of the father's condition. So they took a piece of cloth and they walked backwards. They don't want to see his condition. And they put it on him. The old man knew what was going on, but he was too different to do anything about it. You see, when he came, 
into his senses, he started to curse. I said, Curse be Canaan, for a servant of servant thou shalt be unto thy brethren. Remember reading that? Yeah. Chapter 9, Genesis. Curse be who? Canaan. Yeah. I said, Who is Canaan? I want to know from you. You are a man of religion. I want a DD to tell me. I want to know who is Canaan. Canaan was the younger son of Ham. Ham had four sons Push, Mizraim, Cush, and Canaan. I said, now this old man, when he comes to his senses, if what you say is true, then he leaves the culprit. <coughs> if in my anger, righteous indignation, you my son, if you did that, I might in my anger lose my sense of proportion. I said, you bastard, you ham, and your children, and your children's children will ever be slaves. I can do that. Any man can do that. You and your children, and your children's children forever. In my anger, we have no right to do that. That type of a curse. What's the, your children and your children's children for eternity? What have they done wrong that I should curse them? Hmm? But now, we can do it. You and I, we can do it. But to leave the culprit and leave the three other sons and pick the youngest of them, I want you to explain to me what kind of a God is this who inspires such a book? To say, leave the culprit, Ham. Ham saw his. And now, if I told you that the guy who wrote all that was a master psychologist. So how do you know? I said, look, read it. Read the Genesis, chapter 9. And you see every time the word Ham occurs, it says, and Ham the father of Canaan. And again, mm -hmm. and Ham the father of Canaan. Mm -hmm. And Ham. I said, what about the three other sons? Canaan is the youngest man. Why the father of Canaan? Why the father of Canaan? What? The others are not mentioned. I want to know why. Because in your record it tells you, Ham had four sons. Kush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. That's the order. If God dictated that, that's the order of the birth. But the same God now tells somebody to write and says, no, 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 no. Leave Ham out. Leave Kush and Mizraim and Put and only talk about Canaan. Father of Canaan. Father, that means he's preparing you to think that Ham and Canaan are synonymous terms. So you think when Canaan is cursed, you think Ham is cursed. Ham is not cursed. Ham goes free, his other sons go free, it's only Canaan. Why Canaan? Because you had something personal against Canaan and his descendants. You, the writer. This is not God's word. God doesn't talk like that. So I said, come talk to me. You Christians, come and talk to me. I want to talk to you. Let's organize a meeting. If you have somebody who is really worthwhile, I am prepared to organize a meeting in King's Park at my expense. And we discuss, dialogue. Dialogue. You give me your point of view. For the same amount of time, I give my point of view. And leave it to God Almighty to guide the people to think what is right and what is No votes taken. No judgment passed. Who won the debate? Like we did it with Swagat. I don't know whether you saw the debate with Swagat. No, I'm sure about it, yeah. So I said, look, man, we can get 40,000 people. And I'm prepared to do that exercise. For you! Get me a man. Bishop Hurley or the Bishop of the Methodist Church, or the Lutheran Church, or the moderator of the Afrikaans Church, get me anybody, man, who's got some value of his own. You see, you mentioned that, you know, as the great bender from Christianity, you passed it on to me, okay, and then humility, I said, look, whatever you think of me, may God make your words acceptable in his sight, whatever you said, but I am recognized as somebody in the world, as far as comparative religion is concerned. Right. I'm a self-made man. But I want somebody with a name. He said, Mark, you gave the name. I said, no, not good enough. Mark, maybe you are better than the Bishop Tutu. You are better than Bishop Hurley, you know, in your knowledge of religion. You, my son, John. Maybe you can do a better job than Hurley. I believe that. No, no, no I believe that. Because you have read, you studied, and you know, it's a part of you. So you can do a better job than Hurley. But it won't carry weight. When I spend 20,000, 50,000 rand to get 40,000 people there, mm. they won't come because of you. So who's this John fellow? And suppose you make a fool of yourself. They say, well, this, they just brought in a young Sama that paid you 500 rands, or a, uh, a thousand rand. He said, come, my son, make a fool of yourself. As a mark, come and I give you a thousand rand. Come and make a fool of yourself. That is what people are going to insinuate. Therefore, I said, get me somebody with substance, you know, who's got a weight in the community. Never mind what a fool he is, that we are not worried about. Bishop Hurley is Bishop Hurley, is not Mark, so and so. Am I right, my son? Exactly. Huh? Get me somebody like that, and 10,000 for you personally, or your church. 
I give you 10,000 personally. You get me one of these bishops, any bishop, or a moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, to come and have a dialogue with me in public. I give you personally, you, 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 you can give it to the doghouse. You say, I don't need money. I say, look, give it to the doghouse, man. I give you 10,000 rand. I give it to you in writing if you like. I give you 10,000 rand. You, John, I give you 10,000 rand. Get me somebody big enough that he can attract people on his own merit. Mm -hmm. Then I'm also there. Instead of me doing everything and they all come for do that only, I might get 20,000. But if you had another guy, he can also attract another 20,000. That makes 40,000. So I said, my money is worth me spending that money. Mm. I want to do that. And I want you to help me, Mark. I want you to help me. Sincerely, I feel that I want your help. If you say, no, you can't get anybody, then there's something wrong with your religion. <laughs> no, no, that, that's the obvious thing. Mm. If everybody's terrified of this old man here, there's something wrong with your religion. You agree? If everybody is terrified of me, I said, look, under control conditions there, we get a judge, a retired judge to be the chairman, and just introduce the speaker and he carries on, you know, for an hour, and the other guy carries on for an hour, and he says, right, in the form of a symposium, and he says, go home, my children, and go and think for yourself, as God guides you. Go. I am prepared to give you, or you, John, 10,000 rand present gift. <laughs> Get me a man. Oh, you're saying now he wants to do this? Huh? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> I, I hope you understand my English. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, some so people don't understand do. the English and it sounds so simple. Uh, well, I and thought you were telling us about it at the time you had done this. No, 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 no. I want you to do it for me. Mark, okay. I'm addressing you. John, okay, you Turner, now. I'm addressing you. You get me a man, you know, of some substance to say, look, it's a dialogue. It's not a debate. Uh, Tell him, Have is Jesus God? We can How talk. You had similar things with Mr. Gilchrist and yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, Gilchrist in the in the in, you know. He's not as well known. In other words, now it's all, he's he's riding like he's riding on my caravan. You see? Yeah. No, no, no. I don't on my bandwagon. I don't want people to ride on my bandwagon. Yeah, I want somebody. Of their who, own merit. He's got his, he's got his own like Swagat. Look. Swagat <laughs> had a merit. Yeah. You see? I mean, name. And I spent all the name. I spent all the money. Yeah. I had that place there in Baton Rouge and I had everything. I gave out 20,000 books. I did everything. I advertised in the newspapers. He wouldn't. Yeah. Right. Why did I do that? Because he was a man of substance. Mm. Right? Yeah. I mean, if he fell his from name. grace, his name, you see, it was yeah. there. Even today, to me, he's one of the greatest Christians I had come across. See, we make mistakes, we fall. Yeah. In the sight of God, God can forgive you. Right? But I said, no, I don't hold out against anybody. The man is great, is great. Get me somebody, and I want to do that exercise before I die. And I'm getting old now. Look, I'm 74 now. How long am I going to live? I said, look, before I die, I want to have something big here in Durban. You seem as fresh as a daisy. Like, can we give a couple of responses, and then uh, you've, given, you've been so mm. gracious to give us so much time. And please, uh, we, please, we have please, to be in Westville please, before Ma. now. One would be, uh, I wish I knew somebody. <laughs> I wish I knew somebody I could get and organize and, and uh, give it some thought. But I don't, you know. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be afraid of doing something I don't, like I don't, that. I, don't, I, don't, uh, I, don't. I hear you loud and clear, but I'm oh. certainly not the person to be with you. Good. So, uh, I don't know. I'll give and, some you, I, and I give the reason why. You see, that, that name, you yeah, know, the Mark name would draw the people in. Is a who is, but if he's a moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, yeah. it carries weight. And if he makes a fool of himself, you can't say the fool knew nothing. <laughs> Look, can you? He, early, let him make a fool of himself. Yeah. You, Mark, if you make a fool of yourself, is a who is this back fellow? We don't know him. I agree. I, I hear you loud and clearly on that. The other is is that uh, I, I just like to say thank you so much for giving us your time. I think it's valuable to, uh, to hear this. One of the things that that I'm interested in doing. Yes, Mark. Uh, like uh, our, our news correspondent was here, he said to Mohammed and he said to your other fellow, he says, one of our aims is, you know, we feel like uh, we're supposed to love people. And how can we love people we're afraid of? And there's been so much misunderstanding, and this helps me to understand British, you British, as a person British, and understand uh, British, his love of faith. British. I don't think I'm going to uh, go out of here as a converted today, no. just like I didn't come no. here with that intention okay. of trying to convert you to my way. Thank you. Uh, but I would like to, <clears throat> to maybe come back sometime, and maybe, maybe your son or somebody could share with me just some of the nuts and bolts of your operation here at the center. You know, like, so what some of your goals are, your tactics, your methods, your methodology of your militancy and that kind of thing. 
uh, I've, I enjoy it's like sitting there and listening to my grandfather tell stories or something you know and you tell Bible stories better than I can and I'm a preacher and, and, and I enjoy hearing these you know they come alive to me and uh, you know, I didn't know that I was talking to a preacher I didn't no, know that much to me no, really. Remember that mission, you know, whatever. It's the right as well. Yeah. I mean, anybody is. But no, really, I, I love this, and I think it's a valuable experience just to, to hear you tell the stories and to see them from your, from your viewpoint. So I just wanted to say thank you for all that. And, yes, uh, Mark. And I think that uh, certainly, as you said, dialogue cannot hurt us at all. And uh, I respect you as a, an uh, elderly gentleman. You obviously know your stuff, and you know a lot about my stuff, and I appreciate that. And... Uh, We'd like to just keep the door open to share together. My, my door is open. I understand Mark, that. You don't have to make appointments. Yeah. When you're passing, you just, just drop in. in. You just drop in. Okay. And this is, I'm here, it's all right. Lord is and I was tea. wondering come, come, come sit down. if there's any chance, too, that uh, I might could get a copy of the video cassette that, that your men made of the... We were here on two days. Right. I was in this room here, you know. Right. And the video, I wondered if they would be willing to let me have... Uh, Copy. Yes. I'll bring the tape or something yes. of that nature. Yes. Now, did they also, your people, did they do any? We had, no, we have still ph photographs. Oh, I see, yes. And our men, too, promised uh, Moam, but he said, if I write something, I'll send you a copy of anything I write. Right, right. So uh, anything that we write or publish, you get copies of and that kind of thing. You speak to my son about that. I'll speak yes. to Joseph. Yes. Okay. Yes. Look, you've given us a lot of your time. I know you probably got a heavy, heavy agenda. No, that, you see, this is primary. Yeah. To me, my primary job is to receive people yeah. because on the day of judgment suppose you know this was your turning point in your life yeah. and um, you see the whole thing that like a, on a TV there is <laughs> a right that was the turning point on my life I went there to the IPC I wanted to meet the old man and perhaps you know he might have uh, shown me things or guided me right yeah. oh my lord that guy I mean I wanted to talk to him he was too busy <laughs> so yeah. so did that this is true. So what were you doing? So I was having tea, sir. This is, and you told me you were too busy for my job. So I believe in this. Uh, Anybody you. who comes here, number one, and all my jobs, I take them back home again. Uh, I carry them home, I do my job, and I come back and bring it next morning. Uh, right. But you come first. There was a time when every guest to the mosque was my responsibility. Oh, really? see, Mama Sayyid is doing now, that young man. Yeah. But when we were in the arcade, you know, we had only about three guys. Anybody comes along, he wants to see the mosque. I said, right, who goes? I said, the best man goes. Huh. And I believed that I was the best man. In my absence, my secretary goes. Yeah. Right. In his absence, the third person goes. But if I am there, no man, what I'm doing? First thing is, this is the guest of God. Yeah. To me, I said, this is the guest of God. And I'm too busy? No, no, no. So what's going to happen to me on the day of judgment? I said, God sent the, his guest to you, and you were too busy huh. to guide him. I said, no. So primarily, this is my duty. The rest? It's all second. Everything else is secondary. So whenever you come, you live in Durban? Yes, well, until December. He's here till December. I'm here till next with July. Friends, with friends. You okay. know, young men, come. You want to have a little bit of a... Tea to tea. <laughs> a, 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 a boxing match. <laughs> okay. It, you know, you don't have to pull punches. You say, yes, uncle, you know, it sounded very nice. But you know, you people say so. Don't be afraid. Because this old man can take anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm I can imagine sure. that. <laughs> because it's, to me it's an opportunity yeah. of disabusing your minds or I'm a failure. So mm. Then either way is proving to me, said, look man, you failed. You know, it's not God who failed, I failed. Mm. But I can try. So to me it's an opportunity. Whatever you come with, yourself mark as well. Any type of thing. You said, look, yes, Mr. D. that I read the Quran or I glanced through it. But you know, I find this, I can't. It sounds incongruous. I was going to ask you that. Do yeah. you have any... Uh, do you have any copies of the Quran in English that uh, you know that you like give to guests or anything like that, or do should we buy one down at the uh, store? Yeah, what we do, we give to ordinary people. Yeah. You know, a man comes along like you now, for example. Yeah. Right, and you, John. Hmm. Suppose you were not a missionary. Yeah. Hmm? I would have been forced to give you a book. <laughs> <laughs> you, I would have been forced to give you a book. Yeah. Right. So we should but buy one then. You should buy one yeah. because I said now because you are a missionary. Yeah. See? You send an ordinary Christian, let's say your wife comes along, yeah. and if she gave me this hearing, I've got to give her the book. <laughs> you know? So your brother comes along, you know, if I didn't know, suppose yeah. you came along, I didn't know that you're in the field, you're in the... In other words, now, we are, um, we say, what's a professional opponents, one yeah. to the other, right? So, I can't arm you, yeah. but I don't stop you from By purchasing, purchasing one. one. Yeah, but now, otherwise, to me, 
This is the greatest thing is to give to them. Same as we would like to give a bar, you know, I have a box of bars at home. Correct, correct, correct. But now I said, no, I came to fight you. I don't know how you'd feel. Uh, you know, I'm a black belt karate expert <laughs> <laughs> of, of religion. And, you know, I came to give you uh, a yeah. headache. And then he says, he says, no, I give you this. It doesn't come spontaneously. Uh, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not a hypocrite. No, you just straight on. <laughs> Thanks for your time Mark, today. Mark, it was a pleasure and a privilege. We feel that every human being ought to have the right to examine for himself or herself and make a decision. Many of them would agree this is a better revelation than I've ever had before.